And uh, in the last video, we discussed about the uh, difference between algorithms and data structures. Now, uh, we're going to discuss the types of uh, data structures. So basically, uh, like we discussed or covered briefly in the last video, there are two uh, types of data structures. Uh, there is uh, one called primitive type, and uh, these are basically basic building blocks uh, that are provided by every programming language. Uh, in our case, it's going to be Swift, but any language that you pick, uh, there's going to be these basic constructs uh, that are going to be there that actually helps you to build other constructs on the top of that. Basically, those are, they work as a building block uh, for you. And uh, examples of those are Booleans, uh, character, uh, float, integer, double, enums, et cetera. Uh, now, then the other uh, type of data structure is composite data structure or non-primitive type. So uh, these are the types that can be constructed in the program using those primitive types uh, that we just discussed. So arrays uh, can be a collection of integers. So it's basically a composite uh, type or non-primitive type for uh, of, of this structure. Uh, same goes for tuples, same goes for strings. Strings just is just a collection of characters or sequence of characters. Then you have lists, stacks, uh, trees, hash, etc. So all these uh, are example of composite or non-primitive types of data structures. All right, and uh, then uh, we should actually also learn why uh, we need to learn the algorithm like you know what's the point so if you've been working uh for a while you might ask this question yourself uh that you've heard uh someone say why do i need to know about linked list when i'm never gonna implement it and that is true in most cases for your day-to-day -day job you might not implement an algorithm that already exists, or it is provided to you by the programming language of your choice, okay? But there's a big but here. That's not what, what uh, the algorithm learning is all about. The learning algorithm gives you insight as how particular algorithm works. Knowing a little about the strategies that are used for uh, by the algorithms to solve complex problems can give you ideas for improvement that you might consider making in your own code, okay? This study of data structure is not mere academic, but it's the study of efficiency. It's the study of performance. Given a large amount of data, the goal basically is to find out what's the best way to store this data in such a way where it can be retrieved efficiently. For example, you must have seen and used various collection types. You must have used arrays, sets, dictionaries. But have you ever wondered why there are so many different ways to store the same kind of data, basically, uh, they all are uh, collections, right? Why there are so many ways? So when you look at the high level, they all serve the same purpose as storing a collection of similar types. So the reason is that each of the data structure has its own performance characteristics, okay? So let's consider uh, an array as an example, like, you know, array and a set, okay? So you have array and a set. Both of them are used to store collection of items, but in array, you can order items, whereas in set, you cannot order items because set is a hash-based collection. So the order that you put item in or the order you add item into your uh, array, you know what that order is. And when you retrieve that back, you know that order is gonna be retained. But in case of set, it's not the it's not the same case because it follows the hash based algorithm to determine how to efficiently store that data. But sets are faster to search than arrays. So it takes longer to search an array versus the time it takes to search an item in a set. So that's how basically the different kind of algorithms or different kind of data structures actually work where they have their 
unique purpose. So no one, none of these, like, you know, are like, you know, um, uh, basically one, sol one solution for all, but they all have their own advantages and disadvantages. And by studying them, you actually are learning about these characteristics as what they're good at and what they're bad at or not so good at. That way, you can make an informed decision when you're actually putting your program together as how you're going to use or what kind of data structure you're going to use to store your data. And basically, this is what the algorithm is. You design your algorithm using such data structure where you actually make it efficient to store and retrieve data. All right, so hope that uh, made sense. Now, algorithms is basically, once again, it's a step-by-step -step procedure, okay, that defines the set of instructions to be executed in order to carry out a desired output, right? Algorithms are created independent of languages, so you can focus on steps and efficiency rather than the implementation detail. Once you have created these steps, converting those steps into the implementation in one or more programming languages is rather easy. Once you have the algorithm in place, you, you have to find out how efficient it is. So basically, you, have, you gotta figure out if it's efficient or not. Well, that answer lies in a term called time complexity. And that's gonna be the topic we're gonna discuss next. Okay, so time complexity analysis. Time complexity analysis is basically used to determine the efficiency of an algorithm. So efficiency can be analyzed using time complexity analysis. Time complexity analysis is extremely simple mathematical way of analyzing how long an algorithm is gonna take to execute for a given number of input. And we can call that input as N, like, you know, number of items. And this particular uh, notion is defined using big O notation. And uh, you actually might have heard, if you have already taken some interviews, you might have heard like, you know, interviewer asking you about what's the big O notation or time complexity for this particular algorithm that you have designed. Well, it's rather easy to compute that. Okay, and we're gonna see how we can actually we can compute that. There are some basic basics uh, like you know building blocks that you need to know. Uh, a little bit more about big O notation. So big O notation is basically a way of converting overall steps of an algorithm into algebraic terms. Okay, then we exclude the lower order constants and coefficients that don't have that big of an impact on overall complexity of the problem. So we actually remove all the constants, coefficients, and stuff like that. And then we only leave the stuff that actually impacts the real performance of the algorithm. Reason is when your when your uh, size of your input is going to grow, those constants and coefficients are going to be still same and they're going to have less impact on the output basically time it takes to produce the output versus if they are part of that repeating um, uh, a step so take an example so let's say if an execute if a statement executes uh, once in exactly once that means it's called o of one complex that means that it it's only going to execute once. So there's just, that's the only way to, for that particular line to execute. So if you execute that statement one time, 10 times, 100 times, or 1,000 times, it's always going to be one O of one because one, 10, 100, and 1,000, these are constant. So we're going to skip those. So if there's any statement that executes two, times n plus three, in this case, it's called O of n complex because two and three right here are constants and coefficients. So we ignore that for bigger values, these numbers are not gonna make much difference. So that's why we only consider the number of times that statement executes. So this 
n actually really makes the whole difference because the value of the n for larger numbers is going to make 2 and 3 insignificant. And so we can ignore those. Now, big O notation has simple formula. So if in a statement is just a constant, like defining a variable, like, you know, or initializing a variable and stuff like that, those are constant number. So for example, if you create a variable five, that's O of one. If you have like, you know, a an input that can grow with the with the input, like the number of input that you give, like n is your number of input, then 5n plus 100 is going to have O of n complexity because n is, because this statement, the value of n is going to grow for the larger number, right? 5n square has O of n square uh, complexity because the value of n is going to go in quadratic time. All right, so it's gonna be squared sign. So n times n comes like that, okay? And um, you have like another one that's uh, five, for example, is a constant again, and uh, the equation is five n to the power m. That means its complexity of is O of n to the power m. That means this, this particular value is gonna grow exponentially for a given input. Okay, so those are some of the big O notation, simple formulas that you can apply to compute what your time complexity is going to be, right? So in the next video, we're going to take a look at the example, how time complexity works within Xcode. And we're going to take a look at some, some like, you know, some of the common uh, statements that we write and compute, try to compute its time complexity. Okay, so I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.